Hello, KCIW listeners, and welcome to Curry Cafe, where we put together a panel of volunteers and guests who discuss various topics from whimsical and fun to more serious subjects. Well, hello again. My name is Ray Gary, and welcome to another uh, edition of Curry Cafe. Uh, Rick just told you pretty much what the show is about, and today we really do have some uh, very learned guests to talk about our subject today, which will be windmills, and they'll probably branch off into other related objects. Objects? The Sub- subjects. Maybe objects, too. I don't know. Okay. Go. Let's do our traditional go around the table and everybody introduce themselves. Okay. I'm Rick McNamer, volunteer here at KCIW. And let me real quick also, if you want to join in, give us a text. 541-661-4098. Thank you, Rick. I'm Brett Cecil. I live in Port Orford. I'm in lovely Curry County. I'm also a candidate for state representative in our Oregon State House. And I'm Bill Gorham. I'm a Brookings resident. I'm a uh, marine biologist. I used to say a retired marine biologist, but you never retire from being a marine biologist. Mm. I worked as an environmental consultant for about 30 years. And um, as I'd mentioned uh, before elsewhere, that I've actually worked for virtually all of the super major oil companies, but I was doing environmental work for them. And so I've got a different perspective on a whole lot of issues. Over the last seven years, I've been actively involved in um, here, uh, looking at offshore wind and other things here related to climate change. So now that Bill has gone over all his credentials, I dare anybody to uh, go against anything he says. But before we get into the, to the, uh, the appointed subject this week, we probably we couldn't uh, pass up a live show without saying something about the historic event that took place this morning that could actually affect the world. Yes. Uh, yes. Very, okay. very much so. <laughs> For those of you who and don't know, that is, we're talking that about the historic event was that, that Biden did drop out of the race, and he's uh, endorsing Kamala Harris to be his replacement. And I say, go Kamala. That's my okay. my one comment right now. Long way to go. Yeah, I think a lot of us have been uh, sitting back saying, every, you know, every time we see Joe Biden, he's looks older. He's only a year older than I am, but I don't look anything that old or act that old. <laughs> and you're not the president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't get to make big decisions. No, running for president. Those campaigns can take it out of you. Oh, my goodness. Being president can take it out of right, you. Right. And then you've got a day job. That's right. <laughs> the, yeah. the thing that got me w- wondering more or less first, did you see the thing where he was attending some um, music event? I think it was at the White House. And there's like a dozen people or more standing around him, and they're all kind of moving a little bit with the music. I think even I would have been music, uh, been moving. And I, I kept looking at it. I said, "Is that a cardboard cutout? Is that really him?" And it was. So I don't. I think he's done a very good job, and he he's uh, he's done a lot of good things for the country. But I think he's now done a good thing by dropping out. And he was up against a lot of. Uh lot of trouble trying to do all those things but yeah my opinion there i appreciate appreciate his work and i've been kind of waiting for the rnc to finish their convention because i had a feeling this is when the answer was going to come out to all of this why would you announce that in the middle of someone else's convention right so, good point good point mm. yeah and it sounds like that um having waited until jd vance was identified as the uh trump's vice president uh candidate now that solidifies the Republicans solidly, all, um, in, all in on MAGA and mm-hmm. with Project 2025. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read much about that yet, but it sounds like I don't want to. I would just, it sounded complicated from what little I know, but it, it also didn't sound good. And Bill, I think you addressed that at your presentation a little bit about how that could throw a wrench into offshore wind Projects between the uh, Project 2025 a manifesto, if you will, and the couple of recent Supreme Court decisions about um, environmental regulations and all that, yeah, things will be could be very, very different depending on what administration comes in. Okay. Yeah, so my extensive research this morning, I came up with the fact that there are over six thousand 
offshore windmills in Europe. Sounds like that should be enough of a demonstration project that we should have all the good things and bad things figured out. Do you think so? The difference is that those are all fixed bottom, virtually all fixed bottom. And the ones we would have to have over here is uh, they'd be floating uh, because it's just too deep. So, so they're floating, but somehow they, they maintain their position in the right. in, in the water. They're anchored. Oh, they're, they're anchored, okay. Right. And so, or tethered, however you want to look at that. Well, anchored is the right way because there's different ways of holding them down. Um, and the interesting thing, people say, well, what happens if they don't work? Or what happens if we suddenly get fusion energy or something like that? You pick up the anchors and you put them someplace else. So they aren't like taking out um, however many thousands of fixed bottom uh, platforms, just like oil platforms. And Santa Barbara County, County, Santa Barbara Coast, all those platforms are attached to the bottom. In order to get them out, you got to move all the platforms, and that's not easy. Something that's just anchored there, I mean, it's anchored pretty poly uh, substantial anchors, depending on what they use. But you basically detach the anchor and you take them to wherever it needs to be so we don't have to have them forever out there. And and it, I assume there's a cable then carrying power. There'll be oh. cables going between the different um, uh, turbines, not windmills, but the turbines. And uh, then that goes to a, a presumably a floating uh, substation. And then that gets combined until it's sent, sent to shore. Now, what's interesting, people say, well, what about EMF, electromotive force? It's basically the um, magnetic field that comes out from any uh, cable that's, that's uh, carrying electricity. And um, I heard a, um, a discussion by a fellow who has spent 30 years working on the biological communities around the, plat the oil platforms in the Santa Barbara Channel. And after his discussion about the effects on the Santa Barbara Channel uh, area, he said those are all run by power coming from shore. And so they have massive, big cables that go out there to run essentially a factory in the middle of the ocean. And he said there is virtually no impact to the animals there. In fact, there's, uh, they often will have protecting covered over them so that they don't get run into with an anchor or something like that. And that is a positive habitat. So mm. um, based on just existing practical stuff here in the US, the impacts are not going to be substantial. And then just like you said, there are cables all over the, the world. And the studies that have been done say that within, say, five feet, maybe 10 feet, you really wouldn't be able to perceive it. But um, the interesting thing is perceiving something versus being act affected by it can be dramatically different. Now, just think about if you've got a, a light in your bedroom and it's you can see it's there, but it's not going to affect where you can sleep. You perceive it, but you're not affected by it. So, and then you said roughly, I think, there were going to be, if it goes through, 200 turbines off the coast in Brookings? The, yeah, the estimate is based on um, the report that was done by Oregon Department of Energy that was a consequence of HB 3375 that said, let's take a look at what are the uh, positives and negatives, what are the drawbacks and challenges of having um, three gigawatts worth of power out there. And I'll step, step back for a second. That was, uh, that number was picked because the um, uh, PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, did a study, and they said, all right, given the existing transmission system that we have here, feeding Brookings, feeding Port Orford, all the way up the coast, they could, um, the existing system with very little changes could, uh, could accommodate two gigawatts of power coming on shore. And um, then adding in some ad additional, um, depending on where it was routed, it could maybe do another gigawatt or half a gigawatt worth of local power. So we're using what's coming on shore. And then, so it sort of caps out at three gigawatts. So that with without a whole lot of major changes, we would be able to accommodate up to three. So then the legislature said, all right, go ahead and study that, PNNL, and they did. 
uh, or excuse me, they did that. They told uh, Oregon Department of Energy, and they did the study, and that was the basis for this, the talk I gave the other day, where um, it was looking at the challenges as well as the benefits that are that could accrue from offshore wind. Okay, so Bill, can I ask on on that point? Is that where we get into discussions about scalability of these projects? Because some people want to know how much further can they take it other than what's being planned on. Can we grow that two gigawatts to three to say maybe 10? That's a, an excellent question. And that's one of the, uh, the questions of how can we produce the, the, enough renewable energy to meet the state's renewable energy goals and the decarbonization goals. Right. And um, without trying to, to push too far, the, the I think it's the technical potential of our wind energy off um, off Oregon is something on the order of 62 gigawatts. And that was um, based on some limitations that apparently are, are not in effect anymore. So it could be a, a substantial amount. Now, the question is, is actually something that I've been pushing for a long time because you're talking about cumulative effects. Okay, we could have now three gigawatts that could be for these two um, uh, wind energy areas, the two leases. But if there, if we look at what some projections are as to how much renewable energy we need, we would need um, far more than three. And so from, from one of the, I think from my perspective certainly is, let's start asking those questions now. Let's see if you scaled it up. On the one hand, technically you probably could, but from the standpoint of um, would that mean that you have that much more infrastructure out there that could then push it over the edge and now we have a significant impact, depending on what your criteria is for significance and depending on what issue you're talking about. And on the wind turbine, if that's right, wind turbines themselves. Now you had the presentation where they're, they're huge. They're, what, would you have the Eiffel Tower up, I think, there and they're taller? They're, they're a little smaller than the Eiffel Tower. Okay. But with a, the comparison was with the Paris Games, the Eiffel Tower will be you okay. know, lots of pictures. Okay. But okay. closer to home. And it was interesting because I drove into San Francisco a few weeks ago and crossed the Golden Gate Bridge and looked up and went, holy, wow. Um, <laughs> They're taller than that. Okay. And so they're that's, huge. They're huge. <laughs> no question. There's a, a, doing my little research, there's something called the vortex turbine without the large propeller. I don't know how long the propellers are, but is, has that been uh, looked into? Would that be a better way to have these turbines or do they, you know, not? Pan out. Real good question. I mean, the turbines and the existing uh, blade um, configuration has been around for a long time. And so whether it's just um, that's the best or there's something better that could come along is a matter of, of um, uh, testing them, see what works. I, it's My expectation is there's this balance between inertia. We've got a lot of these things going on. We know how to make them. We know how to deploy them. We know how to run them versus something better that's going to require another ramp up, new types of, uh, of infrastructure, presumably. Mm -hmm. And so um, it seems like if something better could be done faster, cheaper, and more productively, then it would make good sense to do that. Okay. Can you explain what, the, what the, this Vortex system is? If I understand it correctly, basically you have the same uh, sort of center console or center pole but instead of having the blades turn around like a fan, there are um, some sort of, I would assert, almost panels lay, coming down from a, um, a central disc at the top, and the wind blows them around that way instead of having something that looks like a propeller. Looks more like a lighthouse, I, the yeah. best way I could explain it, the ones I saw. Yeah. And I thought uh, they were, so they're not in use anywhere then. Maybe I read that wrong. I think they're in testing. Testing. So, okay. Yeah. All right. And I don't know that much about them. If okay. you're one of the people out there who knows that much about them, maybe you could give us a text at 541-661-4098. 541-661-4098. And the best Operators thing... Operators are standing by. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> just to say that the best thing with that is if you know something, know someone, know some information, please give the source of that information because just getting it off the internet 
is not all that productive. I can't Fear believe here. you said that. Oh, <laughs> that's long. Ooh. Well, here's the text. Okay. We sit with our brows furled while looking over our shoulder to see how they, in quotes, are addressing the ever-increasing disastrous climate change effects. It's time to take things personally for ourselves, our progeny, and all higher, in quotes, earthly life forms. Little steps and big are necessary right now and close to home. Please think through the proposed windmill projects. We must charge ahead and do whatever we can to combat climate change now. Our current and being current and being developed tools may not yet be perfect, but we must utilize them to the full extent. They will be a bridge to the future when we have ideal methods. So if the offshore wind project is a step in the right direction, we must take it. Our imperfect tools may have collateral damage, but we have to fully take climate change as the imminent existential threat that it is. We should no longer be indulge ourselves in a societal climate of overconsumption and an economic system that relies upon continued growth these norms have many unsavory byproducts, including a continuing need for more and more energy. We humans and corporate entities need to live within the natural resources budget of our planet. So they keep going? <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. Um, is Bring up a whole bunch of very good points. Yeah. I can um, sort yeah. of edit, leave it sure. at that. That's because, fine. Thank you for the text. Wow. Wow. Be now, a guest. How did you talk to all that? <laughs> take me a day to type I, that yeah. on my thumbs? Doing it on the computer, huh? Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, so again, we're going to bounce around, well, I am anyway, back to the to climate change and global warming. Right. Just a couple articles and some papers that I gleaned a couple of weeks ago in the Press Democrat. I didn't know anything about it. And I'm not a litigious person, if that's the right word. But in Hawaii, the youth were, they sued the Hawaiian, they were going to sue the Hawaiian government, if you will, the state, about, uh, God, I didn't bring my reading glasses. This is bad. <laughs> But about how how they're not addressing climate change and global warming, and the state finally acquiesced, if you will, and dropped the lawsuit, and the the youth won that lawsuit. Right. You know, wasn't there yeah. something like that happening in, in another state or someplace that where they probably students were suing the government for not taking Mon care of the world that they're inheriting? Montana. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think I can read that. I, I wrote the gist of this article. It said, their lawsuit alleged that the uh, defendants impaired and infringed upon youth plaintiff's right to a clean and healthful environment, including the right to a life-sustaining climate system. I mean, I, I considered that a bit of a victory. Absolutely. So yeah. that wouldn't intrigue me. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, we need more victories like that. Yeah. The youth is out there. Keep on and coming. One of the topics that we were talking, I mean, we're talking about offshore wind, but as I mentioned in discussions prior to our going on air, was that if you don't trust the science, if you don't believe that um, climate change is real, if you think it's a hoax, then you probably have seen no reason for offshore wind or solar panels or um, um, electric cars, anything like that. Um, if, on the other hand, you do believe in physics, it's the physics has been well documented for over 150 years, 170 years, that uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in the air, will trap heat. And so that's pretty well settled. And the um, sort of fundamental outcome of that, if we put more carbon dioxide in the air, was very well modeled and very well studied by uh, some of the best scientists in the world that work for Exxon. And the, um, uh, there have been plenty of studies since then or, or, or investigations into their archives. In fact, I know a fellow, a good friend, who worked for Exxon and who had an opportunity to look through some of their archives. And he said, it's amazing. They're right there for anybody to look at. And their reports showed the same kinds of effects that we're seeing right now. In fact, all of the additional uh, modeling that's been done, all the refinement and everything else since the, the 70s, has just made it more precise and more f certain, but they are the same results. So they knew, and that's the thing about Exxon knew, and um, most of the other oil companies sort of verified all that. Kind of harkens back to the tobacco companies in a way. Yeah, and many of the knowingly just pushing it. I, I remember watching that the, the tobacco execs. Uh, no, I know of no reason or why I smoke. Blah blah, all of that stuff. Right. Yeah, 
Well, that's pr- yeah, pulling the wool over everybody's eyes. So it's not the, not the crime; it's the cover up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, right? yeah, well you, you had the choice whether the or not to smoke. Yeah. You don't have the choice whether or not to breathe. Yeah. Well, yeah. But if if you're somebody that doesn't believe in climate change or well, climate change or global warming, just watch the news in the morning, mm-hmm. where they have the almost the whole country is red, and not not politically red, but red with uh, indications of temperatures in the 90s, or conversely, the climate change, which could also include going the other way. I had a foot of snow on my deck this winter, which is unheard of here. Well, I remember well, that. And that's the, the issue is it's the extremes are more common. And we're, we're being pushed. The, the sort of cor- corollary to that is the cold temperatures in the winter are not as cold. You do still have these unusual extreme events. However, look what happened in Texas a couple of years ago where so many people were without power, mm. which was blamed on the, the turbines not being able to produce electricity, which was not the case. It was the natural gas plants that were knocked offline. Uh. But, um, yeah, it's it's something that... Um, it's it's real, you know. Climate change is there. All you need to do is, like you said, look at what the the data are. I I know you won't know the specifics of this, but I had a, kind of an interesting thing happen uh, not far from where I lived in Alaska. In fact, the crow flies was about three miles away. Uh, as part of some maneuvering, uh, somebody had to put up this demonstration windmill project. It was about a dozen windmills, I think. And they spent millions and millions and millions developing the road to get to where they are and all these different things. It was very interesting, and I, I used to go up there a lot to to try to get decent pictures of that and the sunrise and all that. But it turned out after they were all cranked up and working and everything that, that they, uh, I don't know if it was the inverters or what it was, but something could not uh, operate properly in temperatures below 30 below or something like that, which was not at all uncommon there. Yeah. I, I mean, are they that dumb that, that they uh, didn't didn't test the turbines in a refrigerator or something? Um, I don't know the specifics, so yeah. I wouldn't be able to comment definitively, but uh, there are many, many, many examples of people, well-meaning people, that will say, hey, we got text this technology, and we're going to help these people. And so they 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 take it there, you've set it all up and say, here, go run it. I lived in the Virgin Islands for five years. And um, the examples of consultants being hired to come down to do things like putting in sewage treatment plants, they use things that were good in Cleveland and in uh. Memphis. But in the Virgin Islands, you have different conditions, you have different um, ways of people doing things. There, it's it's beautiful virtually every day. So if you Different don't do it today, climate. it's climate, not weather, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, if you don't do it today, you can do it tomorrow or the next day. But deferred maintenance has some significant problems. And so if you don't have the right equipment, you don't have the right training, you don't have the right procedures, transplanting something that works in one place to someplace else is um, has a potential for being a recipe for disaster. So I'm not surprised that it didn't work. How is the the, the power drop off handle on these long runs of electricity? Um, apparently, with uh, AC power, which is um, sort of the shoes for the shorter runs, mm-hmm. there's more of a loss. But DC power, direct current power, it's significantly more effective at moving at long distances. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. Um, it's the DC lines that are would be backbone lines if they were to be used. So. Oh. So that's why we see in our electrical systems, we have substations. Yep. So the transmission over these long distances. I live in an area in Port Orford where I see the, the transmission lines for uh, Coos Curry Electric Co-op that yep. run all through the back hills in, in town. Okay. And I know those. that's not the electrical current that we use in our homes. Mm-hmm. Right. And there are substations that break that down to a usable to an AC type power. Well, I'm... It, from what I understand, all of the power um, here in most of the systems is all AC, okay. but it's at a, at a much higher voltage. You have to have step-down transformers and things like that. <laughs> so we are getting so far out of my realm, <laughs> <I do. laughs> electrical engineers like, nope. 
But yeah, it's the basics on that. I'm just looking at why do we need substations? People trying to understand why do we have to have all this infrastructure? Why can't we just plug into it and get our power? Yeah. And there's lots of needs for higher voltages to transmit. And then you step that down as it's a safety issue, if nothing else. Correct. It starts coming into our home and our communities. Yeah. And that's that's the engineering side of if you sort of pack it together and you send it, then it's easier than having a lot of little things. Right. Sort of think about it as trucks or trains in a way. But I do want to point out on what you were talking about, Ray, the project that you saw in Alaska, that they had difficulties with inverters. One of the things that I understand just as an everyday person on the ground is that we have research and development. And when they run into an issue like that, we can develop, there can be different inverters made that might be able to deal with temperature. So those are things that can be corrected and developments that can be worked with. Same thing when we're talking about installing these devices offshore, whether they be vortex or... or um, The turbines. The turbines. Or even wave energy. So, yeah. wow. And that was, I was not hitting on that yet because I, I was reading about a project. It's a research project that's happening up between Newport and Walport. Right. Right now, that's just coming online in the next couple of months, but they're making some major steps right now. That's something I'm curious about too. And as whoever our, our friend was that wrote in and text message mentioned that there are all these different ways... And we talked about, you know, in the future, as we develop other ways to, to produce this electricity, what do we do with what we've been using? I don't know that we should abandon what's working. We're going to need lots of different manners or ways of developing this renewable power. It can't just be one thing, is my right. understanding. Again, it's the, the non-renewables are finite. We're going to run out someday, right? Might be our great, 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 grand. Right. I don't know, but uh, yeah. And it's I remember when I was in grade school, they used to say we had 30 years of oil left. Yep. Well, I was yeah. in grade school more than 30 years ago. <laughs> okay, so. That was before shocking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That is shocking. That's right. <laughs> um, and the, go ahead. The other thing is yeah. that it is at, and all of the above that we need. And Brett, you're, you're exactly right. Um, there are, we, we're going to need so much more energy just to, uh, electrify everything, much less as energy demands grow go up. I mean, the simple things of AI, the demands on that, the right. um, um, what is it, the centers, um, the data centers and data equipment centers. centers. Yeah, and so there's going to be a huge push on the one hand, the R and D. How can you do that more effectively? How can you make, use less energy for it? And as the need is there. As you say, well, you can either make more energy or do what, use what we've got more efficiently. Both is going to be Both. necessary. Yeah. Exactly right. And so, uh, as we um, as we have more of these types of energy, whether it's going to be onshore wind with the tower out in the middle of a field or um, the solar panels and such, um, one of the things that I like about offshore floating offshore wind is that if you do, if somehow we have fusion energy and it's no longer necessary, you drop the anchor and you take it someplace else. So it's not, we aren't stuck with it, like the um, uh, oil platforms off the Santa Barbara Channel. So they're there for a while. But in those as well, those have other uses. I mean, I've, I've seen where they've taken old subway cars and dumped them in the ocean and they make great Reefs. Reef, right. 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 And why would we go to the trouble of ripping all this out of the ocean floor? Is there a way that we can leave it there and make it a useful reef for the fish and wildlife that are in the area? And that's something that those are, are, are sort of discussions that could be had when um, it comes to that point. Right. So there is supposedly huge uh, salvage yards or junkyards yard, some around the country where all these old windmill blades are being stored and they have no idea what to do with them. And an interesting thing about that, and one of the things that we really do need to move to, which is uh, a circular economy. And there are a lot of good examples where something that was in sort of limited supply, um, it, if somebody can figure out how they can take somebody else's waste product and make something positive out of it, you can make a business out of it and you can end up having... Um, this circular economy. Now, I don't know the details, and as a biologist, I shouldn't be saying anything about inventions or <laughs> that, but I understand that some of the composites that would go into these, wind these windmill blades could be crushed up and used as road base for, for roads. It sounds, so, it sounds perfect, yeah. And that's in lieu of having to take um, con concrete 
to make them. And the concrete has two aspects about greenhouse gases. It's when you cook the um, calcium carbonate and drive off the carbon dioxide there, and when you make the energy to cook the, carb the calcium carbonate. And so it would be you know, a win-win for that. And given our economy is driven um, by you know, the, uh, the, the profit motive, Consumption. Exactly. <laughs> if we can figure out how do we consume by protecting the existing, reusing the existing resources and all, that's a win all around. So is the advantage of having these windmills offshore as opposed to onshore is uh, one we're not using up to land and the other is we're getting cleaner air or cleaner wind because it's not, you know, if, if wind gets to develop turbulence by going over land, it doesn't, it's not as effective for windmills as if it's just going over the ocean, which presumably that's correct. would not correct the, yeah. create the turbulence. And that's why I wouldn't use the term cleaner, although it, I can understand the point of it. But when there are no trees or hills or other things in the way as there as is on the, uh, the ocean, it can have a longer area that can go a longer fetch. And so it can go faster with less turbulence. So it will be more effective. And so it's more, and that's why what we have our right off Brookings is incredible. It's one of the best resources in the world. So it's like if we have something that is matched by very, very few places in the world as a resource that we could tap into for energy, for clean energy, why wouldn't we do it? And yet I'll answer my own question of why wouldn't we do it if we find out that there are reasons that it's going to be a bad idea. That's why we wouldn't do it. So what I've been advocating for is get real information, get data, do the studies, share the information, share it with people, share it with the scientists, share, share it with the developers. And that's when we're going to be able to make the decision whether we should tap into this incredible resource or we should bypass it. And that's what's going on now, right? Like you said, it's it's going to be years yet with studies. And, and I guess that alone might tick some people off. I don't know why. I'm surprised at the amount of uh, negativity uh, in this community and uh, uh, for being against the wind power without all the knowledge that, that I think that they haven't right. uh, delved into yet. Right. You know. Um, so where are you hearing that pushback, Rick, on, on what subjects? Because I, I wanted to talk about that part of it, too. Well, okay. Well, I have a little tiny example from the paper. Again, we had a little protest here in town a couple weeks ago where uh, a group of anti-wind folks protested right in front of a business in town. It was kind of right across the street here. Now, just a small protest, and then the people in the business, apparently, I'm assuming they were on the other side, they came out and started spraying their signs. It was just a big mess. And I thought, well, that's kind of like two wrongs don't make a right. right. But don't be protesting in front of a business. That just isn't right. But anyway, and I read a lot in the paper. Uh, I thought it was um, about Curry County and also what's the count? I'm a Californian, but well, where Port Orford is, is that a it's thing? Curry. We're, we're still Curry. Okay, but, but anyway. But County is the next county north. Okay. Yeah, Coos County. They have the other But most of the area. board of supervisors, most of them seem to be against any wind development. Right. And uh, let's go back, and here we are, right in, in, Bill, I think this is in your territory in a local paper again about how climate change is affecting right off our coast here. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, about the kelp forest being decimated. Right. And then I didn't know this, but barnacles and mussels, I know they're natural occurring, I guess, but they, I guess there's an overabundance of them right now because is that right or not? Well, I'm not sure on the barnacles or mussels, but certainly okay. the, the urchins are. Urchins, and thank there's you. There's a, uh, a lot of factors that kind of go into that. Um, and the overabundance of urchins partially is a function of the uh, a, a sea star wasting disease that, that did a just damn decimated the um, the uh, starfish and especially the um, very large sun star, which is a predator on urchins. Mm -hmm. Those are gone. So the urchins are in large numbers. They eat the kelp. They eat the baby kelp. The kelp aren't there. So that means that the whole system is screwed up. 
apparently that also affects the kind the food that whales will eat as they're moving uh, moving around and that means that they are starving they're having problems uh, yeah and i did read where the last 20 or 30 years they were doing research on the gray whales which are predominantly off our coast here i guess they were shrinking in size because of food lack of their their normal food and you know those kinds of things and my I guess my main point is i'm a whale lover i nothing more that i like to see than as a a whale spout but um in the anti windmill folks uh, they always say oh it's going to harm the whales well i guess maybe some of it will but uh, they're being harmed more by uh climate change and global warming they're actually being war far more affected by uh boat strikes and oh, entanglement they're... so if you look okay. The NOAA just uh, recently closed a what they called an unexpected mortality event. I maybe got the num exact not exactly right, but basically it was for about four years, and they looked at a significant increase in whale death in California and through Oregon, and they said that various things. But if you look at the data, the majority of the de deaths are due to entanglement with fishing gear or being hit by boats. So if you're really concerned about that, then you should be really supportive of programs that will either slow boats down so that they don't run into the, to the whales or establishing a system that shows where the whales are and then communication and then the, the fishermen can go ahead and avoid them or, or take measures or somehow get the derelict fishing gear out of the, the, the oceans. Right. Now, as an interesting aside, is that it's been brought up very clo very actively about the offshore wind turbines out there. Now, to get a size of the um, uh, cables that would be coming down, they basically are the diameter of a dinner plate. And so they're huge. The expectation, I'm not a marine mammal mammologist, but um, the expectation is a whale, they're using echo sounding and things like that, they're going to be able to avoid something that is the size of a cable that's the size of a dinner plate. But that's the primary entanglement that they're, it's, it's inconceivable that they would run into it or get entangled by that. On the other hand, that could do secondary entanglement. So it gets the, the uh, derelict gear tangled on that, and then the, the whales could get entangled by that gear. And the expectation is, all right, if that's an issue, if that turns out to be something that should be requirement of the people that are running the, the uh, turbines, they need to, to guarantee, have a program to go check, is there any stuff getting caught on the cables, and then move it off, in which end up being a benefit to the whales. Mm. So, Like, it will... That's maintenance, part of the maintenance of that whole... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it has to be identified as a maintenance need. Well, well, sure. And of yeah. course, that, yeah, that will be a huge part of that. Which uh, brings up one of the uh, one of the objections that people have about it is that, that uh, fishermen will lose their jobs and things like that. But it sounds to me like these windmills are going to require maintenance and you just came up with some maintenance I hadn't even thought of, but it's going to create a lot of work in the area. Yes, yeah. And I'm assuming and, the fishermen, I mean, and that's an important... Uh, aspect of life here, for, right. for sure. I'm assuming before this thing gets all set and done, that uh, it, it, maybe we'll have to compensate them somehow. I mean, I would certainly be uh, able or uh, happy to do that right. if it means we're going to have cleaner energy out there. And I, I don't like to see anybody lose their job, but as the world progresses, people lose jobs. You know, when when uh, well, Model T came out, the people who made buggy whips were or on the way out, uh, the, the people, tobacco farmers, the the people who 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 uh, made magazine racks to go in the bathroom are are suffering now that we have cell phones. Magazines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Hey, we'll uh, just to let folks know though. Uh, also, you're listening here to this great conversation and experts. Uh, KCIW 100.7 FM your community all-volunteer radio station. And you can get in touch with us if you want to at 541-661-4098. Operators are standing by. Another quick question, Bill, that I had for you. Uh, somebody said, Brett, about wave action. 
How will these things survive a tsunami? Well, we don't know, probably. We don't know, no. Okay. But interesting, uh, the tsunamis really express themselves when they get into shallow water. Because in deep water, as long as long as a little you wouldn't even know it's oh, happening. Okay. And so okay. if somehow the tsunami uh, or the earthquake that triggered the tsunami was something that then triggered um, a slump or a slide, which is actually going to cause the tsunami, um, that could affect cables and such. But that's one of the reasons that the um, the turbines would not be anchored on the, the uh, continental slope. It's going to be on the shelf. And okay. so that dictates how far out and not so much how far out, but how steep the slope is. And so those are the practical considerations to how how far from shore you could do that. Now, um, if there, when it comes on, when the tsunami would come on shore, it's going to be affecting pretty much everything. And so it's going to be the substations that are right now in Coos Curry. It's going to be the substations that would be associated with that. The harbor's everything. So to have a concern about that, the turbines themselves, it's unlikely that they're even going to know it. I'll be darn okay. So, okay. Yeah. And I know one of the things that comes up for me often is what about our wildlife and, and the fish and other things Huge. in the sea and how they're going to be affected by this. But I as well am concerned about how it's going to affect the people. We've talked about jobs that will occur. I mean, we're going to have to have people working on offshore and onshore to support these things. But what can we do as a county to ask that we have some benefit for our community? So and is there some some way that the county would receive some funding from from these companies that are supporting the windmills? Absolutely. That might help really make a dent in our deficit that we have in our county budgets right now. And what's interesting, there's community benefit agreements and their labor agreements. CBS. And the uh, Oregon Sea Grant from um, uh, Oregon State had a seminar within the last week or maybe week and a half that was all about community benefit agreements, how they structured what to do. Now, a concern I have is if the, um, uh, the community leaders come out and say, no, hell no, we're not going to allow this. We're not going to happen. Um, it's a competitive environment out there so that if a developer says, you know, I see that California is going all in on this. In fact, they're not just the two areas that they're working on in uh, Morro Bay and Humboldt, but it's going to be down in Mendocino and it's going to be in Del Norte County. And if you don't believe that, I mean, as, we, as Brookings kind of goes southwest appearance, we will see them absolutely in Del Norte. And so... Um, if we succeed in saying nothing here in Oregon, then that means there will be no money for a community benefit agreement. Or if they go, well, we'll throw in a small uh, bid to get one of the leases. Now, instead of, you know, it's it'd be you know, a 10, just for numbers, a 10 pot to be working on, we'd be working with two. And, if, and so it's suddenly we're talking ourselves out of being in a negotiating position to get those community benefit agreements. And they are ones that are specifically designed to offset the impacts that you're asking about, Brad. They're, they, why should we suffer from um, somebody else's benefit? Because it's right for that. Or not be included in the benefit. <laughs> exactly. So being in at the table is a good idea. Um, you can be opposed to it depending on what thing, how things turn out as as long as you're in the table but when you go I'm not I've got to walk away yeah. you're out of the game because I've heard discussion around that we're going to just be really strong and say no right up front so later on when it comes time to negotiate we can we have a better stance and I don't know necessarily that that's the best way to take on a negotiation just to say no right up front that's a gamble it, it's a gamble when that's, what, that's what's happening though right and i've equated it to a few people Correct. it's like i personally don't care for recall actions and i'll get into a little bit of political stuff we had that here in brookings last year yes we had a mayor and a couple of council people that were rem recalled from their office my concern with that idea was there was no plan as to what to do or what would happen when you pulled them out and who are you going to put in those seats do you have a, a slate put together to get somebody in there that will do what you think needs to be done and so I want to be really careful about how we conduct these community benefit agreements. And when we look at those, 
what is that benefit going to be for the people? And if we're just saying no to say no, and we had Senator Smith, David Brock Smith, ran his campaign for his primary, he had three people running against him. Mm-hmm. And the re- I think the reason that none of those people really did very well on the ballot is they were all saying, we're going to say no to the state house and everybody there. We want it our way. We're not going to play. We're not going to get in there and play the game with you. Right. Yep. And that's that's not a way to, to get business accomplished in any way. So I, I just want to put that out there for people to think about if that's the position you want to take. Because an absolute no, you're not going to have a negotiating position. Yeah. And as long as you have based your no on um, facts, on uh, the, a, f- a good balance of what the knowing what the issues are, because you are passionate about birds and you are convinced that too many will die. You also have to be sure that you understand what Bohm did to to pick the areas ultimately that we're putting out for lease, and the same with fisheries, same with the um, any of the other resources. I say that because when Bohm wrote up the uh, uh, the um, protocol that they used for identifying these wind energy areas, and there were two parts to it. One was Normally, they would just identify these wind energy areas that are part of the overall first call area. It's a much smaller area. They then did a draft wind energy area before issuing the final. And they did that, as they say, in response to our two uh, senators and two of the representatives for the coasts, as well as the the, um, governor, saying, we need a pause. My com- comment to all of those elected officials is that's a cause, but what do you want to have happen during that co- pa- that pause? Well, Bohm used it to add in this extra step. And if you would would be interested into seeing what did they do for this this citing, there's about a 200 page um, report that goes along with the um, uh, all the stuff that's come out this last summer this summer about the sighting and they show graph after graph or picture after picture after picture of how they had how they identified where the birds are where the different fisheries are where the the um the main areas are and you can see how that overlays where these these lease areas will be and from and i'm going to get the number uh probably off but bohm was asked by i believe it was the fishing industry to avoid um, the the higher the higher areas, and so they identified something like seventy five percent of the areas that the fishing community said um, stay away from, and Bohm uh, agreed with that ninety eight percent of them. So what the fishing was saying, these seventy five percent of the area is good for us. Bohm said good, generally. So the siting is critically important, and so, that's where so they parred the, those sites, the call areas down. Absolutely, based on that input. Port Orford had a call area, and yep. very early on, that call area was removed because there was so much pushback on it. And I know the coos call has been reduced greatly as well. Correct. So it's just been through this process of getting people out and discussing it, industry people and people in the community, right, and finding out where where the more impacted places would be, and we can work around those. Right. Now, I do want to throw out one thing. It's going to be a complete change, I guess, probably. But on the East Coast, um, there is a substantial amount of opposition to their uh, fixed fixed uh, bottom mm-hmm. um, offshore wind. And there was a group, a professor at Brown University uh, had some students that went ahead and did an analysis uh, looking at the different groups that are opposing the offshore wind. And then they sort of checked it back of who was working with whom and who was funding whom. And there was a lot of dark money, a lot of uh, money that was of questionable resources. And then it came back to organizations that have been against climate change, against um, um, the decarbonization, all these, which goes back to the... um, uh, you know, it's 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 big money. It's oil companies, and so why would oil companies be against this? Especially when you hear, oh, well, the oil companies are going to put these things out there. Absolutely no way the oil companies are going to do that because if we have a lot of good renewable energy, then we won't use up those resources that are going to stay in the ground. 
So there is a good reason for it. Now, I don't know, don't, don't, want, any, don't want to make any suggestion that it's happening here. But the people that don't want to talk, the people that are just against it, they don't want to know what uh, concessions have been made or what should we be doing for these community benefit agreements. If they say, oh, no, hell no, then you go, well, what's your motivation and what's your data? What, why? So, uh, some of the motivation is they don't want it because they, many of them don't believe in climate change at all anyway. Right. Uh, I, I was at a... Um, city council meeting not long ago when one person got up and spoke, well, uh, climate is always changing. We're always getting warmer and colder, and uh, that's all we're doing now. But uh, obviously a person that didn't know about climate change. Well, it's, can, it's, can we correct. hit on that point? And I know Bill's already said it here, and I think we discussed it earlier on. It's the human impact part of it. We know that the climate changes around the planet. Historically, we can see that. Totally. Millions of years in history not just in the past two or 200 years, but people do make an impact on the climate. Yeah. And we know that's the fact. And it's making the, an, an impact on our own impact that we can do. You, that's the you, part that you, we can make a change. You know, you know that as a fact, but that guy that spoke at the city council mm -hmm. meeting, who has, I'm sure, other people that are agree with them do not know that as a fact. They say that's nonsense. There's no way that we could be polluting this vast area with our actions. I say, look at the water temperatures. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Uh, Gulf of Mexico is a hot tub now. Mm -hmm. We've had our first Category 5 hurricane in, was it June that yeah. it started? Beginning of July. Early I'm, ever. I'm, I'm wondering yeah, I see, when I see all these, these extreme temperatures around the country when I'm watching the news, at what point does do these places become uninhabitable by us? What temperature? There's some pretty good examples of modeling of that. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's not... In you know 2100, it's not 2200, which is a lot of times when they say the, the massive um, flooding from um, the sea level rise is occurring. Um, but it's it's in the next decade or so. And right now, there are places that are uninhabitable. And it's a combination of the temperature and the humidity. And so you have that combination. It cannot be as hot as um, in other places, but you can't cool off. And right. That's that's you either reject that those data or do you I, I don't you I don't know how you explain it. And didn't we have a wasn't it last year I think in Florida where the water temperature got above a hundred hundred and one. I mean, and sea life was just decimated there around. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't those kind of make people realize that there's a problem? But it yeah, a lot of sea life can't live in those temperatures. Right, and we have. Algae blooms, Florida is a great place to look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those are toxic algae that things can't live in, and we can't right. use those shorelines. Humans can't use that. I, and I, I like to point out to people that our water temperature is along our coast here in Oregon and California is why we have the climate that everybody loves so much on the West Coast. Oh, yeah. Because we don't have these huge swings of temperature because right. the water helps to, to mitigate those temperature changes. Right. Okay. And, Brett, one question uh, you might know. Uh, a little bit about what well, I'm surprised at the group of people, and I'm a member of the California Tribe Central, but is the tribal, most tribal people, even in where I'm in California, Northern California and up here, they seem to be against the uh, wind, offshore wind. Have you noticed that? Or do you talk to the the tribe? I hear from both sides of that within the tribes. Okay. Okay. You know, I've had somebody approach me that wants me to understand that this is how we're going to get out of our climate change. Okay issue and he's a, a tribal member okay and you know just wanted to make sure that i was hearing both sides of the story okay and so i, I appreciated I, having that input and it's really helped me to understand a lot more of what's okay. going on All right. and i think that really really ties into something that i have been trying to push which is open honest discussions and trying to have civil conversations and if somebody's going to come and say i'm absolutely opposed to everything you stand for it's like okay although i've seen that happen. I had a project where uh, it was an Australian company that was trying to bring liquefied natural gas, LNG, into Los Angeles. And a fellow from Heal the Bay came in and um, stood in front of the, the project manager and poked him almost in the face and said, I absolutely oppose everything you stand for. I won't do this, won't do that. Now let's talk. And the project <laughs> manager said, I agree. If I do that, I do that, and, and nobody wins, then we both lose. So let's talk. And afterwards, there were a number of other projects trying to bring uh, natural gas in. 
And um, that was the, this particular project was the only one that they didn't register a an objection to. So it's a matter of talk to people. You may be on opposite sides completely, but see where do we get together? What are, how do we solve the serious problems and not cause other effects that we don't want either? So it's that sort of thing and and saying here are the data that we have. One of the complaints that's been argued many, many times has been there's been no consultation. Well, Bohm has, I'm not saying they did a great job at it, and the state did even a worse job at it, in my opinion, but um, they have had many, many, many meetings, and they have provided a lot of information. The problem is that it hasn't been readily accessible, and I'm not inclined to, have, to try to stand up in front of a bunch of people that are going to yell at me. And so if it's a matter of saying, let's look at what we have here, because there are many valid questions, many Agreed. concerns. Absolutely. Agreed. But we're not going to get to understand what those are and how we can solve them unless we have civil conversations. Right. And I know one of, one of the issues that I hear about is that Boehm won't listen to us. They're not taking into consideration or negotiating with us. That's not their job. It's not their job. <laughs> They're there to yeah. collect the information, give information to the community, and try and get some some input there so that they know how to move ahead. But if you go look at how they changed the, you know, if they had the big call areas reduced down to the wind energy areas, they threw in the draft wind energy areas right. and the extra step. And if you look at the the graphs, they did a hell of a good job of removing that. Yeah. And so they listened very closely based on their actions. And so just because you have discussions and somebody listens to you but doesn't follow what you say, just because you didn't get your way, doesn't mean you weren't listened to. And so that consultation doesn't mean that you get what you want. On the other hand, if you are there and in the discussions, you may be able to sway people. So. Yeah, if you don't yeah. have a seat at the table, you're not going to have a say. 100%. Exactly. And public, Thanks for making that point. Public discussions, from what I, I haven't been to any, well, other than <laughs> your presentation, yeah. but that was pretty metal, pretty nice. But they get uh, yelling and the screaming seems to be the the yeah. rule of the day lately. And what, what gets done there? Nothing. Nothing. It gets yeah. recorded. That's all. And, and I, haven't, all. I haven't personally attended any of the in-person. I've done more than my share of hours of listening and webinars and... and um, all of the virtual meetings that, that Bohm's put together. Yep. But, you know, it can go on for quite some time. And I hear the same handful of people lodging their, their same statements in each one of the meetings, which is fine. They can do that. That's, all that's all we have to do is drill, this. baby, drill. <laughs> and that solves everything. <laughs> it will certainly come to an, an interesting um, future. <laughs> yeah. So There are limitations on that. So what happens when, when that well... Oh, dry. come on. Now you're trying to make sense. I know. <laughs> Just stop it. My mistake. Just drill, baby, drill. <laughs> well, okay, we're, we're coming in. We're getting very close to our last minute here. Unfortunately. We have yeah. a minute and a half left. Uh, does anybody want to spew out some pearls of wisdom that we haven't already discussed? I can re-spew. <laughs> you can what? Re-spew, <laughs> re <-spew>. please. <laughs> okay. I don't think we're going to solve this with any one. Oh. Point, you know, we've, no. we're going to have to deal with solar as renewable and using whatever tidal powers we have or wind energies that we have. It's going to take a little bit of everything to to help resolve yeah. our renewable energy issues and to address the climate crisis that we have going on. And a specific, a very important aspect of that is that we can have these alternative energy sources. However, we have to make sure that they are not. The caviar, as one of the opponents has said, the off floating offshore wind is the caviar of alternative energy. Um, I would take exception to that, but the point is we don't want to be um, spending lots and lots of extra money for things that are not necessary if we have something better. On the other hand, if it turns out we don't have an alternative, we're without a turn. So yeah, where do we go? Okay, well, the boys up front have started the bump of music. It means that uh, we're down to our last 15 seconds. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the Curry Cafe at KCIW LP in beautiful Brookings Park. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs>